Thank you for coming. I'm tickled that on such short notice so many people are interested in learning about mutual aid and cooperative networks. My name is Pat Battle, by the way. I'm the director. And this is Zev Friedman. And we're the team today. And welcome. Great, yeah. We had a, our participatory exercise in mind to do in this space, but then the chairs are out, so we're gonna do a modified version of it instead, just to get a sense of who is in the room. So I'm gonna start with easy questions and then work towards hard questions. And if you agree with the statement, raise your hand. And if you don't, don't raise your hand. Okay, any questions? All right, we're gonna start easy. I like tacos. All right, that's pretty taco friendly group. I like all tacos regardless of filling. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> uh huh. Okay, I had a delicious breakfast this morning. Hmm. Mm hmm. I can pretty easily have access to a delicious breakfast whenever I want to. All right. Pretty lucky on the breakfast front in this crowd. I came here today with specific ideas for what I want to learn. All right, so we've got a pretty open-minded. Uh -huh. OK. I'm a little confused about what exactly Cooperate WNC is. Yes. Uh -huh. All right, about half are a little confused. We'll call that open-minded. I have my own ideas of what I would like mutual aid in Western North Carolina to be about. Mm -hmm. Great, okay, some people come in who've, who've thought about this some and have some initiative. I currently participate in a cooperative business or organization at least once a week. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I do my banking in a credit union. I grow some of my own food. All right. I grow a lot of my own food. Mm -hmm. I have my health care needs completely met. <laughs> All right. So we got to talk to these ones. <laughs> What's your secret? Well, I'm part of a mutual aid health care organization. I consistently feel that my needs for human connection are fully met. Don't be ashamed. Great. I work in culturally diverse settings on a regular basis. Hmm. That was an interesting hand wave. It was like that. It was like, <laughs> sometimes. Mm hmm. Either I have or a member of my immediate family has been followed or harassed in a store or a business by security personnel. Hmm. I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college. Hmm. I worry that my mistakes and failures will reflect poorly on my entire racial group. I've struggled with addiction or have a close loved one who struggles with addiction. I believe it's likely, I told you they're gonna get harder and harder, that the human species is going to survive past the year 2100. <laughs> okay. I think that there's a pathway, this is even harder, a pathway to connection between divided political camps. <laughs> okay, less likely than the human species surviving past the year 2100. Uh -huh. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I know what to do about climate change if only I had control of the resources and political will. <laughs> Don't be shy. Yeah, OK, OK. All right, thanks, y'all. That was just to kind of get our thoughts going there. Any other questions you want to pop on them with that? Well, I'd make a comment. I don't really, I think I know what to do about climate change, and I don't want control of political will. 
I think that's not a way to have control of climate change. You know? <laughs> yeah, any of y'all gotten into this book yet? Charles Eisenstein's new book. Oh, Charles Eisenstein. Yeah, he just put this one out. And it's, uh, it is, it's going into that, how it's, I think, related to what Pat just said, that, uh, that, we've, that we've tended to be approaching climate change as if it's a single linear process of just sequestering carbon. And in fact, that, that is uh, a type of solution-oriented thinking that emerges from the same um, causes that the problem itself is coming from. And so his whole point in this book with the new story is that we, is that we have to be re-narrating our entire approach to what we call problems and um, recognizing the deep interconnectivity between things rather than just focusing single-mindedly on a goal. All right, got two copies of that Mondragon book notes. Good. Don't have it up here right now, but I, I reference that a lot. Yeah, Project Drawdown. It's a really interesting book attempting to quantify the different potential for sequestering carbon from different activities. And what's the single most effective way to sequester carbon according to that book? Education. Education of women. Which is what the UN said when they said we had 12 years. Yeah. Well, they said empowering women. So it's not just education, but also making credit available to them. And there's actually a connection that goes way back in history that I'm going to talk about to that. Um, might have to do with why Mondragon can hap happen where it did. OK, so just to kind of paint the arc of the afternoon and evening, because we are going till 7. We were like, how, how fast can we do this? In? And there's just a lot to go into. This is kind of a giant topic. And we also wanted to make sure that it's not just a big information download, but that this is structured in a way that y'all can engage with this material and feel like you're leaving here today having found a connection point with your own life and your own projects. Um, so the, kind of the arc of the day is designed for that purpose. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how I got into this right now, then hand it over to Pat, and he's going to do a big juicy dive into Mondragon and his visit there and everything he knows about that. Then I'll do, we'll take a break, and then I'll do a big juicy dive into Cooperate WNC and kind of the outline of what we're um, thinking with, that, with this project. Um, and then we'll go into some more participatory um, activities after that that are around getting you all engaged with it and figuring out where your own projects and energy connect with this with the hope that each of you gets to leave today with some next step for yourself, whether it's tiny or large, in terms of how to be part of this. Um, so any comments or questions on that process before we jump in? All right. Well, I guess I'm going to tell a story. This And um, we're going to be talking about a lot of books, because a lot of this information, frankly, is coming from books. and. Uh, you know, they're amazing people doing amazing things out in the world, and I'm learning about a lot of it from their books and websites. But these folks I actually got to visit as well. And this, is, uh, this book is Milpa Seed to Salsa. It's also written in, in Spanish, right? So we have the, uh, Milpa de Semilla a Salsa. And um, there's a bunch of authors, but this book is about this village in southern Mexico, just north of Oaxaca City, called Yuku Yoko. And, um, I got to visit there in January and February of 2017. And this is a village that has been there since um, before, way before the Spanish came along. According to the people we spoke with, they said they've been there 6,000 years in this place. But they, they did weather the Spanish coming through, and they somehow managed to hold on to their land, unlike a lot of the indigenous people there. This is a, a Mixteca people different indigenous than the Mayan or Aztec or any of those folks um, as a certain people. And they lived in this one place. When the Spanish came along, the Spanish forcefully logged, clear-cut logged the entire region they were in, got it down to the ground, washed all the topsoil away, just like happened here. Yeah, um, But it's these limestone soils. And so in a lot of places where that happened, then it created a negative feedback loop, and the rainfall died back, and it turned to desert. Right? But they've still managed to live there um, at, throughout all of that and maintain this actually really vibrant, relatively intact society. And one of the things that they're doing there is they're keeping alive this, cultural, this culture of mutual aid. 
And I, I didn't even know that when I went there. I was going there to study milpa farming, which is this kind of integrated uh, polycultural style of farming, which is we're mimicking at Earth Haven where I live. And it's like corn beans and squash and other plants mixed in in a polyculture. It's also set into a larger context of forest agriculture and a multi-decade rotational uh, strategy. And I had been learning about them and their traditional practice of this and was going there to study that. And I actually learned once I got there that they were also keeping alive this amazing mutual aid culture. They have this, this complex of 12 villages, everywhere from like 70 to 150 people in each village. And the villages are within 10 miles of each other, so it's pretty close in together. And they have a formal mutual aid association between those villages, right? It's not just like a loose, yeah, we're having a crop mob or something. It's like committed. It's reinforced through ritual, through family ties, um, and through economics, right? And so this comes down where, uh, like, while we were there, there was this group of young men that was going to repair the roof on this old woman's house. And it was like signed up, scheduled, and they were all doing it. There was no money exchange involved in that particular thing. Right? That was just what they were doing, was going to repair her house, because that's part of the mutual aid work. It also involved cash, though. And they have a, a savings pool type, um, type approach, which we're going to talk more about savings pools later on, but where they were pooling money and using that to loan into existence various enterprises that their community considered essential. One of the things that they were doing while we were there, we ran into these two men about my age who were building this greenhouse um, about twice the size of one of those greenhouses. They actually had, it was really funny, they were, I'm, I don't have great Spanish, and we were trying to talk to them through a translator while they had an air compressor running <laughs> that they were building the greenhouse with, but they still generously took like 45 minutes and talked with us. And um, they were telling us that the, they're, they're doing this tree planting, this reforestation project where they're planting in the landscape 700,000 trees a year just in the area of these 12 villages. And they're, they're growing the seeds in the greenhouses as they were doing. They were building the greenhouses to expand the tree propagation project. They were starting all these trees from seed. It was a species of alder and a species of pine, which they were planting in polyculture together. And shortly after we talked to them about this and they were telling us about the project, we walked about 200 yards up the hill to where there are these two spots. One, there was this denuded limestone soil where it had been deforested, and one right next to it that had been deforested, but they had planted these tree mix on when they started the project 27 years ago. And the one that had the alders and pines, I stuck my arm in. There are about eight or 10 inches of topsoil from 27 years of that um, growth, right? And so after I kind of digested this experience, I was like, wow, that I think is the most um, compelling living example of mutual aid that I've come across. They had this, this living network that included kind of culture, economics, food. There was healthcare involved in it, care for elderly, schooling the kids. There was also stuff around intermarriage between the villages. It was like kind of a clan system, all integrated in this way that had allowed them to survive the Spanish invasion and taking over the landscape and is now allowing them to take care of their, um, their village member needs in the, in the short term and also create this long-term initiative for healing the landscape and bringing topsoil back and improving their ability to farm there through collaborative economics. And so that was this really powerful experience for me. I really highly recommend the book too. And, um, and it gave me a vision of, of like, okay, something like this, right? is what we might have maybe in 200 years <laughs> if we get it together in our region, right? And then also to see the power of survival that was in that, you know, that, and this is something really been honing in on, and this is like one of Kropotkin's, uh, this is the guy who kind of popularized the term mutual aid in, in the English language, even though he's Russian. One of the things that he, the, point, the points he was proving is that the main pattern in the survival of people and the survival of species in general is cooperation. And that there is this whole kind of coup by the industrial industrialists in Britain who began the Industrial Revolution, who cherry-picked Darwin's observations of life for the competitive examples and ignored the preponderance of them, which were cooperative. Right? 
and that the whole concept of survival of the fittest is a true concept, but the most fit are the most cooperative, not the most competitive. And yes, competition exists too, and that's a part of it. And sometimes it gets hard to, to tell where co cooperation is happening and where competition is happening. Like in the mycorrhizae that grow on a tree root, sometimes it looks like competition and sometimes it looks like cooperation between the same two exact organisms. Right? So that insight, though, that cooperation is the basis for survival. In this book, Kropotkin exhaustively goes through all of these biological examples of that and then goes through the history of human culture and through culture after culture after culture, all of our ancestors, all the continents, the main example, the main mechanism that they used for survival was cooperating at a scale that allowed us to be resilient to major change and major challenges as well as pool resources to set ourselves up for a more positive future, right? So that if you want examples, that's a great kind of source book to go to for that. And here is a living example of that this people that, you know, many indigenous people did not survive the Spanish coming through and the English coming through and the French coming through, right? And many of our indigenous ancestors, I'm gonna say well, from the hand raising that most of them are European, we had indigenous ancestors in Europe and they didn't survive the Romans coming through, right? But the ones who did survive usually survived through mutual aid, through, through cooperation at a scale that allowed us to organize and be resilient. So that's kind of the underlying, I think, narrative and, and um, uh, historical cultural uh, wisdom stream that this is all coming from. And we're gonna get into the details of it more. And Pat has visited an incredible example of mutual aid, which I hope you'll share with us now. I will, but I could do another yeah. whole talk just riffing off of what you were talking about. Yeah. But I, we, I know, I don't think we have gaviotos out here, do we? No. Uh, mm -hmm. That's another example yeah. of people living cooperatively and another example of them getting that they could live in a terrible place and change it. And they planted Honduran pines. They kind of mm. struggle with the concept of planting Honduran pines because they were not native, but they figured something growing was better than nothing. And literally, after a decade or two, whatever, the rainforest came back. Where is that? That's in the worst land in Colombia, where the worst drug war stuff was going on. Yeah. yeah. What's the, do you remember the name? The, the Ayanos, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. The Ayanos. Um, and they had, to, they had to deal with like the government and the, drug, and the revolutionaries and the drug war stuff, and they just kept doing it. They stayed nonviolent, they, they took care of everybody, they stayed out of it. It's a powerful book, it's really inspiring. I highly recommend it. Um, and it's the same thing. They plan stuff, you know. We can do it, you know. 200 years, we don't have 200 years, Mon. You know? no, right. <laughs> we gotta get on this. Well, yeah. yeah.